Well, it's great to be back again. This is uh, Buck Benny. We've got John with us and Kathy Fuller Seeley with us again. And uh, I won't introduce them so much as I did last time because we already did that once. But <laughs> I will say John is from the great podcast, uh, This Day in Jack Benny, correct? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I just want to make sure I get it right. And I got this eyeball behind me that keeps showing up. But anyway, I, I will try and keep my <laughs> eyeball hidden. It's kind of gross. So. <laughs> There you go. Well, uh, today's episode, uh, we have Rod Serling appearing on the Jack Benny Show. So I'm really excited about that. It's a wonderful episode. Love Rod Serling. Love yeah. The Twilight Zone. Fantastic show. Uh, but before we get started, I thought I would address a complaint that I had about our last show that someone left in the comments. Apparently, one of John's wonderful fans has gone on and commented that I don't let John speak enough. Now, don't you have any control over your fans, John? Come on now. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't I, talk that much. I, I, I do have control over them, which is why I sent them to, you know, give you yeah. a hard time. I think that comment was actually from John, just from somebody <laughs> else's computer. Going, Let me talk. But anyway. <laughs> well, we still do so. so. Yes, yes. Well, and then I love it because if you looked at that at the last week's episode, I cut out all my bits and put them on the end, and I kept you guys up to the front. So it wasn't very much of me, but still apparently too much of me as it is. So I'll even talk less, but probably not. Not in this episode. Well, I, I tend to ask questions, and then I don't end up doing the talking. Like, let me ask you, yeah. what are your favorite Twilight Zone episodes? Ooh. My favorite Twilight Zone, and I've got a question for you after that. Um, favorite Twilight Zone, but let's go with Kathy first. Do you have any favorites to stick Well, I, mostly I want to hear about you all because I'm just young enough that I really wasn't watching it when it was first on. And I've not been, I didn't watch Star Trek, you, you know, that's, I, I, I wasn't watching TV much, and I'm only coming lately to the show. So I've seen very few. And so I want to know what uh, uh, experienced fans love. So. Well, my favorite episode ties into the question I'm going to ask in just a minute, back to John. But my favorite episode is, uh, I believe it's called Time Enough at Last. Oh, yeah. Burgess Meredith. And yeah. where Burgess is uh, uh, works at a bank, I think. And yeah, yep. he works at a bank. And gets in trouble because he's always reading under his desk, always had a book. And then the store, the manager of the bank or whatever will come and give him a hard time because he's not paying enough attention to the customers. Kind of like being on your phone now would be, but he's always got a book. And so he ends up uh, going into the vault to, uh, to get away from everybody. And the vault ends up closing. And then there's like a nuclear explosion that kills everybody. Uh, and he comes out of the vault and everybody's gone. And he doesn't really, he, I love it because he doesn't like, he's not <laughs> upset about this or anything. All he does is immediately think, oh, time enough at last, I can read my books. And so he goes to the library that, and he stacks up like tons and tons of books. You can tell he's been doing this forever. He's got all these books stacked up. This year I'll read these books and next year I'll read these books. And next year I'll read these books. Um, anyway, I, I, I shouldn't give away the whole thing. So anyway, he, but it's a, it's a it's great, a great story, twist. A nice oh. twist. What was that? Yeah, there's a great twist ending. Yes. Uh, let me tell you some of my favorites. My <laughs> favorite, is the trade-in where these old people go to choose a new like robotic body. Yes. So that's a fun. And I'm going to list a whole bunch for other people to check out. If you've never, you know, here's yeah, a place yeah, to yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Many Twilight Zone episodes. Uh, the Doll, that's a scary one. Yes. The Eye of the Beholder, It's a Good Life, another scary one. Uh -huh. To Serve Man, lots of fun. The yes. Invaders, and The Lonely. Okay. okay. You like The Invaders. Huh. That is such a different one. It is. <laughs> I love that it's Agnes Moorhead in that. And Agnes yeah. Moorhead has two things. She's, I mean, three, three, at least three things she's really, really famous for. One is for being Endora on Bewitched. The yeah. other is for on suspense being in uh, wrong wrong number. Number, wrong, sorry, wrong number. Yeah. And that's a great piece that she does in that a great performance, but it's all dialogue and it's all 
wonderful, and that's one of the things she's known for. The other thing she's known for is the Invaders episode of Twilight Zone, where she has virtually no dialogue. It's, Talking at all, yeah. Yeah, it's it's all like just just silent, like a silent movie or sort of thing. Uh, and and so it's really strange that she would be famous for these two things that are exact opposites of each other. But yeah, I, I love that. Um, uh, yeah, interesting episode. And so then, what, uh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, what question would you ask me? Oh, my question. I'll get to my question in just a second. Let me think if there's any other episodes that I'm thinking are, I mean, that whole first season is so good. The very first episode, Where Is Everybody, I think it's called, with Earl... Um, that I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, Holloman, Earl Holloman. And he does a, a really nice job in that. It was a great way to present Twilight Zone to go, okay, here's an episode that's not so wild. It's just essentially feels like anybody's nightmare. You've all had that nightmare where you wake up and there's no one around. There's no, you go outside, there's nobody, nobody. And you walk, he's walking around the town, there's nobody there. What's going on, right? And then it's got a nice twist at the end, a little little Twilight Zone twist to show you how the show kind of works. And it was a great, calm kind of introduction to the show without getting too wild. And then it gets wilder as certainly as the series progresses. But, um, and there's, I have, go ahead. Can I ask you all a, a contextual question? Yes. Do you think the Twilight Zone for American viewers out there, was it a sort of continuation of suspense and the radio dramas, or is it co more connected to a sort of rise in popularity of science fiction? And, you know, that, or did it just come out of the blue? As I'd say show? both. Yeah, I, I think that one of the things that made Twilight Zone interesting and successful is that there's also some kind of social commentary. So for, you know, the fuddy-duddies, they're like, oh, it's just science fiction, no big deal. Mm -hmm. And then for, like, the hippies or whatever, they're like, oh, man, the world today. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I think that's really what makes it work. I would say, to me, it's got a closer similarity to suspense than just about anything else. It, it's essentially taking suspense, going, okay, how can we make it for television? Which they did make suspense for television. I mean, it did come across, but it wasn't that successful. But it was suspense with twist endings on it, with the concept of, of different cast, or the anthology. So there was a lot of similarities with it. But suspense. the difference is there is always something unexplainable, right? Yes. Whereas if you look at Alfred Hitchcock Presents, that's a lot more like suspense for television. Yes, yes. I agreed. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I just think it's awesome. And then the other show that I present on one of my other podcasts is uh, Dimension X and X minus one from radio. And I think there's a lot of similarities too, between those shows and Twilight Zone in that it's a half hour format. They're really well written, just like Twilight Zone. Um, I kind of wish Rod would have used some scripts from other people sometimes like Roddenberry and famous writers and things. But he, he just used original things that he wrote and things that um, Matheson, um, I forget Matheson's first name right now, but uh, things he wrote. So there, there were a few writers that he had. Some like the Hitchhiker. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. And he had Earl Hamner Jr. that wrote some of them, who, of course, is most famous for writing the, the Waltons and creating the Waltons, which is kind of cool. Um, before we move on from, oh, wait, let's stick with Twilight Zone for a second. Uh, my question back to John. Uh, of the episodes of Twilight Zone, if you could, because one thing that, that I really miss in Twilight Zone is that it does not have an episode with Jack Benny in it, and I wish it did. Yeah. If you were going to put Jack Benny in one of the episodes of Twilight Zone, what oh, yeah. episode would you put Jack Benny in? Uh, I There's an episode where... There's like a store owner and, uh, you know, things aren't going well for him. He breaks his glass and then he finds a genie in a bottle, right? Yes. A lot yes. of crazy things, yes. you know, and, but like none of their wishes work out right. I think that would be a fun one with Jack Benny. I agree. That would be a very good one with him. I was thinking time enough to, at last with Burgess Meredith, Jack could have done a really nice job in that role and it would have been yeah. fine for Jack. But um, what did you come out of the vault though, so? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and you would have had a vault with Jack. I mean, there's certain things that would have just worked really well in that episode with Jack. And I think Jack could have totally 
Yeah, I, well, I just think he would have done that. So you, you send, um, uh, who's the guy who guards the vault? Isn't there yeah. a one late episode, radio episode where he gets to come up and yes. be, you know, yes. so uh, you could do it where Jack is happy to stay underneath and then um, <laughs> yeah. Ed, Ed is, is, is happy to be. Well, I, mean, I would love it if they would have had, uh, it wasn't it Ed Kearns was the vault keeper. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you had him actually in the episode being the guy that he has to sneak by to get in the vault or something, that would have been awesome. But uh, yeah, that would that would have been a great episode for him to be in. I would have liked him to have been in any of the episodes. I'm just delighted he sort of got away to be in a Twilight Zone episode by bringing, uh, you know, and who knows? He could have wanted to be in episodes, never was in one, thought, fine, I'll bring Rod onto my show and create my own episode and put him <laughs> in this way. Another question, do you all happen to know, was Rod on television much now i know he introduced the twilight zone episodes but he's a good funny i, I enjoyed his performance yes. was was he you know playing roles or ever on television much himself i th i think he was a little frustrated with the fact that he was such a good actor so because <laughs> it it drove him crazy by the i mean it, i've heard he's got um, there's clips there's on the internet i mean on, on youtube there's little like hour long presentations that he's doing to multiple like colleges. He taught at a college for a long time. He, uh, uh, and then he, then he, he went to colleges and talked. And I think it was sort of a canned bit that he did. It was sort of like, they want to hear about Twilight Zone. They want to hear about um, uh, Night Gallery. So I'll present that, but I'm, I'm going to present my frustrations with, life in general as well and he talked about his frustration one of his biggest frustrations was the fact that his whole thing what made him who he was was being a writer he loved being a writer and so he's writing all this stuff but after the twilight zone he could spend forever writing something and he wrote he wrote a wonderful um wonderful an interesting story about a plane that has a a bomber there's something about it, somebody put a bomb on it sort of thing and uh it was a made for tv film and he said it was great he enjoyed writing it he thought he did a good job he thought the the cast did a great job presenting it and he was delighted with it until about an hour and a half or two hours after it, it aired because then it's when they got their first bomb threat of somebody saying they put a bomb in a plane and then many over the course of the next two or three weeks there was bomb threats all over the place because of inspired by his TV I, movie that he made. And he said it was like the worst Twilight Zone episode ever. And he just wanted his life to be over at that moment, you know, and, and things. He just, he, it's the worst thing he ever did. He, so he thought, and then, and that was just indicative. It's like one bad thing after another happened to him. And then um, he, they go, Oh, you know, we gave you whatever it was. 200,000 to write that film. Um, that's great. Uh, we'd like to give you 500,000 if you would sponsor our product for these three 30 second commercials. And so he's like, yeah, he's like, so, so I can work for a year and create something that I'm proud of. And I create this thing, or I can go on and, and hawk, you know, whatever yeah. it is for, on television and they'll give me more money than I'd make in three years. And it, and he just couldn't get used to that, the fact that he was more popular as a spokesman than he was, than he could ever be as a writer, because, you know, yeah, that was that's frustration. And I agree with Kathy, his performance in this episode is surprising, because usually you just see him, you know, as the host of the show, but then when you see him, like, he's dynamic, and his, uh, his physical comedy is very funny as well. Yes. And well, uh, at one point he knocks over a typewriter in this episode. Yeah. <laughs> it that sure was... looked like of everything I've ever seen on Jack Benny, it looked like that was an accident that he knocked over yeah. the typewriter, but they just kept it in there. But it was great how they both are like lifting it up and putting it back. And, and then he almost knocks over some other stuff on the table that catches that stuff. But yeah. Talking about some of the things that Rod Serling wrote in the episode, they mentioned a movie that I'd never heard of. I watched the preview Requiem for a Heavyweight. Yes. Great film. So I, that looks like a drama. Have you seen it? Yeah, I've seen I've seen 
there's two versions of it. It was written okay. for Playhouse 90 originally. It's one of uh, his first, the first thing he wrote, it wasn't the first thing he wrote for television. It was one of the early things, was, was called Patterns. And Patterns made his career. It, it was such an impact on people that they said, oh my gosh, this is what television should be. And so he writes Patterns. It does so well for Playhouse. It was either Playhouse 90 or it was one of those um, 1950s uh, uh, play, Playhouse type uh, formats. Anyway, uh, it did so well that they made a movie out of it and it did great. Then he wrote another few plays because uh, he said, you know, it was hard to sell anything, you know, at, yeah. at first. And then he sold Patterns. And once he sold Patterns, he said, from there on, everybody would take my calls and my phone rang off the hook and I never ever had to worry about anything again because they buy everything. All, he said, it doesn't matter what I wrote. They would buy it and they put it on. And, and unfortunately I did write a bunch of things that I shouldn't have sold. <laughs> so, so he said, if I wrote a bunch of, but it, it, for us as an audience, you watch it, you can tell it's Serling. I mean, it doesn't matter. Bad Serling, good Serling, bad Serling is still good. Good Serling is insane. And one of the things he wrote, and, 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 and so after that, they started going, okay, is this guy flashing the pan? Was this a one-time thing? It's, it's maybe a year later, and he writes uh, Requiem for Heavyweight. And again, boom, as big as Patterns, probably bigger than Patterns. And Requiem for Heavyweight was fantastic. It, it had a uh, father-son team in it of uh, Ed Wynn and Keenan Wynn. And, and they did beautiful together. Uh, they were really worried if Ed was going to be able to pull it off because it was a serious role. Edwin's never done a serious role. Yeah. I mean, it still had his humor like in there, but uh, he, he nailed it and it was beautiful. Um, I think it's, it's better than the movie because the movie doesn't have them. The, the movies, there's different actors playing the part. Oh, and... Jack Palance plays the the fighter in the in the ninety minute television uh, version. In the film, I think those are all, oh. I think all three of them are different people. I can't remember. Yeah, um, and it's still good. The the film's good, but the the ninety minute uh, TV show is insane. And he and he wrote just a ton of great shows and had troubles with sponsors throughout, complaining about things. Um, there's one famous one that he talks about. Uh, they were bringing in a, uh, gosh, what was it? They were bringing in something and it, and it had, maybe it was a, maybe it was, I know, they were bringing in coffee. And so they had a, the, the thing is somebody was bringing in coffee and bring, bring that coffee or something. And the, of course, the sponsor was a tea company and was like, <laughs> it was like, no, no, you can't bring in coffee. We can't, I mean, we can't have coffee on my show that's about, I'm, I'm a tea person, you know. And so they had to change the line. So they bring in, bring me a tray. And so they bring, and it's like, who the hell is bring me a tray? It's like, you know, whatever. And so he was really frustrated with, with all that kind of stuff where they'd change. He's like, I write something. I want it to be what I write. I don't want you to change what I write because it, something about your product. It's like stupid. And so that's one of the reasons he went into Twilight Zone because then he thought he could write about all these things and, and wouldn't get, in and, and it worked by and large. He didn't get bothered as much on Twilight Zone as he did in other things. But What, what were the years of the show, Twilight Zone? Oh, which Twilight Zone uh, was 1959 until 1965, I want to say, four? Right? I think that. that frame. Yeah. yeah. It ran for five seasons the fourth season being it expanded to an hour when it expanded to an hour like a lot of shows expand to an hour it didn't really cut it, it seemed too bloated it wasn't right for that format yeah and so then well you mentioned back to a half hour the last season and then it got canceled okay you mentioned there's some good rod serling episodes and some some poor ones yeah. the ones that aren't as good i find are a little bit boring so yes. you bring that to hour and, and that's a, a problem <laughs> yes yes well the other thing rod liked to do and i think that's probably why he it would have been interesting i never heard him talk about being on jack's show but i bet he loved it um was because he liked to try and write comedy he in twilight zone lots of the episodes were where he was trying to write comedy 
I think it's, I like his comedy episodes okay. They're not quite as good as, you know, his, his great hard hitting episodes, but a little piece of comedy throughout his episodes, I think is really helpful. I think certainly Time Enough at Last has a lot of comedy elements going through it. Um, but folks just kind of rake him over the coals for his comedy, and that's too bad that he, that he, mm -hmm. uh, variety and things will be like, oh, here's Rod trying to do comedy again. The guy can't write comedy. And so, like, his, he had Carol Burnett on an episode, and that episode didn't go over very well, and so forth. But, yeah. Connected to that, I wanted to ask if you all had any favorite other parody episodes of The Twilight Zone. You know, I'm mean, where where someone else is trying to do a um, you know a real or, or satire on of Twilight Zone. Uh, Saturday Night Live does Twilight Zone sometimes, and they do a good job. Uh, that's, that uh, Ricky thing. Nelson caught in all the other sitcom kitchens is is my favorite. But, uh, oh, there you go, there you go. Yeah, I didn't yeah, know I I remember there was a, a Simpsons episode that I thought yes. was funny, but I can't remember the details of that one. Yes. So yeah, Twilight Zone, it's such a cultural touchstone. It's in a little bit of everything. Like Twi like Star Trek is all over the place, um, parodied and things. The other thing about this episode that I like um, is it's a chance Jack in his radio show would often do a parody of a movie or of a TV series or whatever it was that he was going to do on his TV show. He didn't do that as much as he did in radio. And right. to see one that is actually done for television that couldn't have been done on his radio show because Twilight Zone didn't exist at the time and is very much in the flavor of what he would do for these other shows, I think I think right. it really made it interesting. Well, that's a very good point. And you know the inside joke he made by talking about Ingrid Bergman and um, uh, not uh, a gaslight. Because yes. that's what got Jack in trouble. He tried, because right. he'd done Gaslight versions yes. so many times, and when he tried to do one on television, the film studio said, oh, no, 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 we're going to sue your, your pants off because yeah. it's too close. It's going to ruin the value of our old film. Whereas right. they didn't care that much if you took, if you parodied something on radio and only took a little bit of it. They yeah. Were, the studios were fine with that. So... For him to mention Gaslight and Ingrid Bergman is just yes. a lovely little undertone. Of well, speaking of, have you seen his version of Gaslight? I've never, I've only heard the radio version from 45. I haven't seen the television version, but the radio version is great. Yeah. Well, and next week we'll see the, uh, the uh, TV version. So you get a chance uh -huh. for both of you guys to watch which, that. Which I understand if this, if this is the right one, maybe with Barbara Stanwyck. That um, he told, he held it in his, you know, they wouldn't let him broadcast it. And something like four years, three or four years later, they yeah. finally let him. Yeah, I want to say it was done in 53, probably, yeah. 53, 54. And it's not seen until 58 yeah. or later because yeah. they had a legal battle and he finally got the rights to do it. And then he just showed it and it went away. And that was, <laughs> I don't think, yeah. And they didn't put it as part of the syndication package or anything. So. Uh -huh. And I had never seen it, so I just, I just uh, was bumbling around uh, and bumped into it, and was like, "Oh, it's here! Somebody had it!" So I, I got it. It's not a great copy of it, but that's all right. It exists, just like this. I mean, honestly, the shows we're gonna watch, like the, like this Twilight Zone, you look at it and you're like, I mean, this this episode with Rod Serling, and you're like, okay. I wish this had a better copy. I wish this wasn't as blurry as it is or low resolution or whatever. Hey, but we have it and I'm just glad to have it. So, yeah. Hey, I was wondering, setting you up. Yes. If you've seen any other Jack Benny television shows that remind you of the Twilight Zone. <laughs> I do. Uh, I, I assigned us to, to watch one actually and uh, we're going to play it for you guys right now. But uh, uh, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll play that clip right now, and then we'll come out on the other side of it and talk to you about it so we don't spoil it. So enjoy that, and we'll be right back. Oh, hi, Mr. Carson. Oh, excuse me, fellas. I didn't know anybody was in here. Oh, that's all right. We're just waiting for Mr. Benny to come off stage. Well, he ought to be in a couple of minutes. He's just winding up the show now. Well, I'd borrow a little of his cold cream to take the makeup off. How'd the show go? Oh, great. As usual. You know something? 
That Jack Benny is absolutely amazing. I mean, the way he goes on year after year. He never seems to get any older. I mean, he looks the same year in and year out. I can't imagine how he does it. Well, that wraps up another one. started 15 years ago. <laughs> well, Johnny, don't breathe a word of this to anybody, will you? I'll be back as soon as I can pull myself together. But first... Now we're back. <laughs> oh, wow. so it's funny. amazing, the power of well, editing. This is, funny. this is how my students online watch things. They just go next. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> too bad I was assigned it next. Did you I've enjoy never, it, John? <laughs> I've never seen it before, and I thought it was so funny. And of course, I love the Twilight Zone, very Twilight Zone. Ask and uh, you know it's it's sort of shocking when they first pull the head off. Yes, that's in a way I, I wish that they hadn't put the canned laughter behind it because you're right it was so authentically shocking that yeah. it, it's like as I said I it would almost have had a bigger impact to do it Twilight Zone version where yeah. you, you don't hear anybody laughing. Yeah. It's, uh, well, and the fact that the they the music they play is so perfect it gets this eerie music starts playing when they start doing it and uh uh it was just such a great play on him being 39 the fact that that they have johnny carson is on the show i mean i can't think of any other guests that would have been better at that part i mean it, that's some of the best acting i've seen johnny ever do he yeah. just looked completely <laughs> shocked and flabbergasted and like oh my gosh um, and I love it when they take they, his back, they open up his back and it's a, it's a, looks like it must be a 45 record that's in there. <laughs> You're like, boy, they must change that a lot while he's talking and somebody's back there changing the record on him. Oh, get to the next record. <laughs> Reminds me of a chatty Kathy I had when I, in 1965, I had a 20-inch high doll that had little tiny records you stuck in her back and right. she'd say, you know. Hard. <laughs> well, I think that's what John's episode that you talked about, the doll, is based on. The, the Chatty Cathy, Talkie Tina was the right. the girl in in that, and so I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Well, well, we'll be, we'll be well, go ahead, John. 
I was going to say, I got a, I got a pop off pretty soon here. Um, but I wanted to mention for people who don't know, Jack Benny is now on demand on prime video. So you can uh, check it out. Very good. Very good. Really? Have you, have you tried? Cause they make somebody showed sort of grandiose claims that they thought they had <laughs> all the episodes from 51 and 52 and, I only saw an announcement that said starting in September coming shows the Jack well, Benny program. Yes. And it, it'll be, it's some of the shows. It's not, certainly not all of them, but, but it, I'd love that to make any available we can. The last thing I want to talk about really quick is people know Rod Serling from the Twilight Zone and they know Rod Serling from Rod Serling's Night Gallery, but there's a show that he, and he didn't have much to do with Night Gallery, really. I mean, he wrote some episodes. He introduced a lot. He introduced all of them. But, but it was mostly by the writers. He didn't have much control over it, and it drove him crazy by the end. But the other show that he had as much control over as he did Twilight Zone, that virtually no one knows about, is da, 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 The Loner. And The Loner was his immediate follow-up to Twilight Zone. The Loner appeared in 1965 is when he did The Loner, and uh, it only ran for one season. It has Lloyd Bridges in it. It is a wow. Western, and he had talked when he did Twilight Zone. The only way he could see getting by the sponsors was, and the network interference, was to either do a Western or some science fiction show, and he did Twilight Zone. And then after that, he decided the same thing. Okay, let's try it with the Western. And so it's one of the later Westerns. Uh, Westerns were disappearing. Say, is he on the cusp of interesting Westerns starting yes. to... I think it was the last interesting Western other than, well, that same year, I think, I think there was that. Branded came out with, uh, that ran for two seasons with Chuck Connors after The Rifleman. And that was a pretty decent series. And of course, uh, the other one that started up that season that was the bigger hit, biggest hit there was uh, The Big Valley, started in 65. But by about 70, they'd all be gone. Um, except for uh, Gunsmoke and Bonanza would be the only two that were left. And Bonanza went in about 72. And at the very end, 75, the very first Western was the very last Western. Uh, Gunsmoke was the first serious Western in 1955. And it left the year in 1975. So pretty amazing, the whole story yeah. of the Westerns. But we'll get into that some other time. But John, well, thank you for joining us and everything. Yeah. I'm glad you got a chance to, to join us. Thanks for setting this up. And I know everybody is going to enjoy this episode. Yes. And we'll bring you more John next time. So make sure you tune in. <laughs> and this is, this is a fantastic episode. So I hope you all enjoy it so much. Thank you both for joining me again. What a fun thing to do. Hopefully you can both join me next week. And we'll just go week by week and make our way through. So I'm excited about it. So Thanks. bye, everybody. From Hollywood. The Jack Benny Program. With Jack's special guest, Rod Surley. Brought to you by... The Careful Drivers, Careful Buyers Car Insurance Company. State Farm Insurance. What do you mean? Look at all the State Farm Auto Insurance stickers. Man, they sell a lot of insurance. My State Farm agent tells me they insure more cars than any other company in the business. You with State Farm? You bet. How about that save $10, $20, $30 or more business? Well, I'm saving a nice piece of change by being with State Farm. I don't know why you wouldn't. And boy, what service they can give you. Do you know that they have over 8,000 full-time agents all over the country? And more claims people in more places than any other company. Go right to the white line, will you please? They tell you you don't give up a thing to get State Farm's low rates. I believe them. Hey, that was the last one. I wonder how it looks. No, I'm sorry he isn't in yet. All right, I'll tell him. Goodbye.
Hello, Mr. Benny's office. Yes, yes, that does sound important. Maybe you better talk to Mr. Benny about it. Mr. Benny, it's for you. Who oh, is it? <laughs> it's your publicity man. Oh. Oh, I better answer that. Help me down, would you? <laughs> oh, my squeegee. <laughs> Hello? Well, why can't we use that color picture? Oh, dear, it's beautiful. I mean, it shows up my blue eyes and everything. <laughs> my hands are too red. Miss <laughs> Gordon, we'll have to change that detergent. <laughs> well, well, all right, I'll have another one taken. Mr. Benny, I know you own the building, but it's so embarrassing having you wash the windows. Why? Well, last week a policeman saw you on the ledge, and for two hours he tried to talk you out of jumping. <laughs> I know. Well, why didn't you tell him you were just washing the windows? Oh, I don't know. He was passing me cigarettes and fruit. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Well, I better finish working. Oh, by the way, did my writers get here? Oh, yes, they've been working in the other room there for hours. Oh, good. Oh, I think I've done enough window washing for today. <laughs> hey, what happened to my bucket? Oh, it must have fallen down. <laughs> well, I'm going to get out of these overalls. Oh, here's some of the pages of the script we was working on. The second joke is mine. <laughs> What's the difference? Only two pages? You've been working for hours. Well, you see, we're used to working with a pencil, and we can't get used to the typewriter. What do you mean? Well, every time it rings the bell, we get up and answer the door. <laughs> well, you better go on back in there and keep on writing. Oh, all right. The second joke is mine. <laughs> well, Miss Gordon, I think we can answer some mail now. Huh? All right, Mr. Benny. Hello, Mr. Benny's office. Oh, yes. Uh, we're on the 10th floor, room 1007. You're welcome. Goodbye. Who's that? Mr. Rod Serling. Oh, good, good. Is that the Rod Serling of Twilight Zone? Yes. And not only that, you know, he wrote Requiem for a Heavyweight and wrote a lot of wonderful dramatic shows. Yes. Yeah. Well, why is he coming here? Well, you know, for a long time, I've been wanting to get some writer with intelligence, you see, to work with my writers. Yes. <laughs> no, I really... Uh, I, you know, I met him at a party the other night, Rod Serling, and he promised me he'd come over and work with my boys and, you know, give them a little class. You know. Well, have you told Dickens and Shakespeare yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, and I... Gosh, I don't know how to bring it up. I, I, I hate to hurt their feelings. Well, how can you hurt the feelings of two guys that use an electric fan to slice salami? <laughs> I, I guess you're right. Have them come in, would you please? Yes? <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought there was somebody at the door. There is. Mr. Benny would like to see you. Baby, come on. The boss wants to see us. I'm making a sandwich! Well, shut off the fan and come in here! <laughs> now, now, fellas... Oh, I see you got the pages. Yes, yes. Uh, the second joke is mine. <laughs> I, that's not what I want to talk to you about. Now, fellas, sit down, will you? Sit down. After you, Heidi. Oh, no, after you, Victor. Oh, no, after you, Heidi. Sit down! <laughs> Now, fellas... I'll go in the other office. All oh, right, thank you, Miss Gordon. Now, look, fellas. I don't know how to say this. Really, 
What I'm trying to say is... Uh, you don't like the second joke? <laughs> no, no, no. This has nothing to do with it. Look at it. Now, look, fellas, we've been together for a long time, haven't we? That's About right. About 18 years, right? That's, that's right. And we've got along very, very well. But there comes a time when even the best of us, you see, needs help. Like, for instance, Gilbert needed Sullivan. You know what I mean? <laughs> we not only know what you mean, we know it for a long time. But we didn't know how to tell you. <laughs> tell me what? You need a partner. Now, wait a minute. I don't need a partner. You need a partner. Now, it's all right to write this kind of comedy, but you should write it with a little finesse, a little intelligence. Now, that's why I've hired Rod Serling to come in and write with you. Rod who? <laughs> Rod Serling, how can you be in this business and not know the man that writes these wonderful television shows. Oh, yeah, he's the guy that wrote that there fight picture. Sir. Yeah, the wreck of a heavyweight. <laughs> That's wreck, William. Wreck. That's right, the W is silent. Oh, shut up! <laughs> well, anyway, fellas, he's going to work with you. Well... We ain't exactly in agreement with you that we ain't got no class. <laughs> but if you think so, you're the boss. Come on, Heidi, let's go. After you, Heidi. No, after you. <laughs> oh, no, after you. Get out of here! <laughs> they ever learn how to endorse their paychecks, I'm going to fire them. <laughs> Mr. Serling? Oh, send him in. Good, good, good. Good to see you. Good to see you. I'm, I'm awfully sorry to be so late, but it took him 20 minutes to bring me two. Bring you two? What do you mean? Well, as I was entering the building, I got hit on the head with a bucket. <laughs> It's a shame. Did you bring it up with you? <laughs> no, why? Oh, nothing. <laughs> well, anyway, Rod, I'm sure glad that you're, that you're willing to come over here and work with my writers. Well, Jack, I've been doing drama for so long, I thought it might be a good change of pace for me to try some comedy. Certainly, of course. Listen, Rod, I told them all about you. They're in the other room working. Go right in, introduce yourself, and I think you'll love working with I'll them. get started then. Go ahead. Right. Go ahead. You'll love it. Mr. Benny. Yeah. Would you like to sign these letters now? Oh, sure, sure, fine. I'll sign them. Right now. There's one. Jack Benny. <coughs> Jack Benny. Yeah, I like that name. Yeah. How do you do? I'm glad I took it. <laughs> Jack Benny sounds good. There we are. That's fine. Thank you. You're I mean, why did they, why did they throw you out? Well, Jack, all I said to them was, what was Mr. Benny's motivation of his character? And they thought I was calling you a communist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for heaven's sakes. Look, fellas, if you don't understand a certain word, ask him what it means before you throw him out. <laughs> Ron, go back in there. It'll be all right now. I hope so, Jack. Go ahead. <laughs> Don't worry. I ball him out. It'll be all right. Poor guy. 
First he gets hit in the head with a bucket, <laughs> then my writers throw him out. <laughs> oh, hi, Jack. Hey, Jack. About, Mr. Benny. But Dennis? What do you want to see us about? Oh, well, what I want to see about this is really very, very important. Yeah, yeah. Now, you know, for a long time, I've been wanting to elevate the quality of my program, you see? So from now on, you'll have better acting, better scenery, better scripts. Better salaries. Better salaries. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> what I'm trying to do is upgrade the whole show. Would it help if I sang with a rose in my teeth? <laughs> Dennis, will you stop with the jokes? I'm serious. You know who's in the other room working with my writers? Who? Rod Serling. Rod Serling? Rod Serling. Yes. You know, it wouldn't hurt to have a college graduate associated with this show. What do you mean a college graduate associated with your show? I happen to be a graduate of the University of Colorado. You are? Yes, I have a BA and an MA. I have an M.A. too. You have an M.A.? Yeah. She's home cooking. <laughs> Dennis, that's just the kind of stuff I'm trying to get away from. I don't blame you. Her food's awful. <laughs> Look at it, fellas. Do me a favor, will you? Go on home, and as soon as we have the first script by Rob Serling and the writers, I'll send for you. All right. All right. So long, Jake. Rod, who? <laughs> oh, excuse me, Brother Jack. Yeah, what? I was just thinking, you just said that you wanted to elevate the quality of your show. That's right. Well, uh, it's a coincidence, but Dennis and I have been working all week on a commercial that'll fit right in with your plan. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, sir, and I know you like it, Jack. Uh -huh. well, what, well, then let me hear it. Oh, right. Come, Come on, man. From an opera. Mm. Okay. Real high class. <laughs> See you later. Yeah, we'll see you later, Don. Cheer up. Yeah. <laughs> Rob, what happened now? Jack, collaborating with those guys is impossible. While they're working, the radio sets on, the television set is blaring, one of them sits there coloring a comic book, uh, and the other one's cracking nuts. <laughs> Well, who's putting down the joke? Oh, the short one. He can type with his toes. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sakes. Look, look, Jack, I know I, I promised to help you out, but I'm afraid I can't go through with it. But, Ron... No, 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 really, Jack, no kidding. I, I, I can't work with these crazy, impossible things that make up a comedy show. 
I have to work on characterizations that are thought out, plots that have a point, drama that has a point as well. Oh, for... I suppose you're gonna tell me that that stuff you write for Twilight Zone makes sense. Well, I think it does, Jack. Oh, yes, some say... I can't understand what it means at all. I don't think there is such a place as Twilight Zone. Oh, <laughs> well, Jack, certainly there's a Twilight Zone. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Look at it, the Twilight Zone is... It's a place of imagination, a land of shadow. To reach it, you write a dream. To enter it, you need only your imagination. Well, those are beautiful phrases, but they make less sense than what those guys write in there. <laughs> well, we both made a mistake, huh? I'm sorry. Well, Jack, no hard feelings. No hard feelings. Okay, Jack. I'll Go see on. you again right. soon. <laughs> That bucket must have hit him harder than I thought. What's with Rod Serling? You know, I can't, can't tell you. You know how you misjudge a person? Now, he thinks that my show is silly and that his stuff makes sense. He thinks, tell, tries to tell me there's a place like Twilight Zone. <laughs> I, well, I got to tell my writers that he's not going to work with them anymore. Hey, fellas. <laughs> I'll tell him tomorrow. Well, I'm going to go home now, Mr. Benny. Uh, could I give you a lift? No, thank you. It's such a nice night. I, th I think I'll walk home. All right. See you tomorrow. Good night, Miss Gordon. Good night. <laughs> I can't get over it. An intelligent fella like, like him trying to tell me that there's a twilight zone, a thing, a place. I don't know. Oh, well. right over there, right across the street. Yeah, I must have had a dizzy spell. Guess I washed too many windows today. <laughs> Gee, I'm tired. I've been walking around for hours. Just a minute. Huh? Pedal is supposed to go around the rim. <laughs> Oh, stop joking, will you? Oh, look, look, mister, I can't let strangers in. <laughs> what are you talking about? You work for me. What are you talking about? I work for him. Him. <laughs> what seems to be the trouble, Rochester? This man's a little confused, Your Honor. <laughs> Your Honor? Yes, I'm the mayor of this town. As a matter of fact, they named it after me. I'm Mr. Zone. Zone? Twilight Zone? You can call me Twy. Well, look, Twy, there's some mistake here. This is 
This is my house. Your house? Yes, it's my house. It belongs to me, Jack. Jack. <laughs> What's the matter? I forgot my name. <laughs> it's pathetic. <laughs> pathetic? No, that isn't it. <laughs> No, my name is Benny. Benny. Which is it, Benny or Jack? <laughs> Boo! Benny Jack? <laughs> no, no, my name is Jack Benny. Jack Benny, I'm on television. I've never seen you on television. <laughs> For heaven's sake. Rochester! Rochester, tell him. Who's the greatest entertainer in America? Nat King Cole! <laughs> You're fired. I don't even work for you. Now look at him say, what's going on here? I'm Jack Benny, I tell you, and this is my house. No, 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 this... mister, take it easy. Uh, Rochester, call the professor of psychiatry at the university. Yes, Your Honor. <laughs> hey, mister, I want you to take it easy, sit down here, and tell me, why do you keep thinking this is your house? Now listen to me. This is my house, and you're going to get out of here, or I'm going to call the police. I came right over as soon as I got your call. Dennis. Dennis. Why? Who is this guy? I mean, who is this guy? You know me. Tell him who I am. Tell him I'm Jack Benny. He's Jack Benny. How do you know? He just told me. <laughs> Dennis, you know me. I never saw that face before in my life. Quite sure, Doctor? Mm -hmm. He's not a doctor. He's a singer. He sings. He loves to sing Irish songs. Yeah, that's right. I do like to sing. Go ahead, Dennis. Sing. Sing an Irish song for him. Sing when Irish eyes are smiling. I'll show you. He's a tenor on my show. Sing. I'll prove it to you. Go ahead. Sing Irish eyes are smiling. Okay. When Irish eyes are smiling. <laughs> Don't you want to hear more? No. Oh, wait a minute. You guys aren't fooling me. You're trying to drive me crazy. That's what you're trying to do. You know, they did that once to Ingrid Bergman in a picture. But you're not going to do that to me. You know, you're not going to drive me crazy. You're my tenor, Dennis. And you're Rod Surly. And my butler works for you. And I'm Jack Benny. And that's my violin right over there. That's my violin. There. See? But that, that's not a violin. What do you mean, that's not a violin? It's mine. I'll play my theme song for you. Listen. <laughs> Why'd you stop? I broke a string. <laughs> Strings on a trumpet? It's a clear case of schizophrenia. Me? No, the trumpet. <laughs> Obviously, it thinks it's a violin. Lay it down on the couch and I'll talk to it. <laughs> oh, cut that out. <laughs> that does it. You win. I am crazy. My butler works for you. My stupid Irish tenor is a brilliant psychiatrist who sings bass. My violin is a trumpet. And I'm Ingrid Bergman. Help. Help. Help, Jack. 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 Well, he's gone, but he'll be back. This is his house. He belongs here. Anybody who claims to be 39 years old, as long as he has, is a permanent resident of the Twilight Zone. <laughs> Jack will be back in just a moment, but first... Jello 
with fresh fruit taste. It's the freshest, finest tasting Jell-O that ever was. And that means everything you do with Jell-O from now on is going to taste even better, from the first bite to the last. Oh, you'll know it's still Jell-O by the wiggle. We've kept that. New Jell-O is in season and ripe for picking now. Pick some. product of General Foods. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And now that I'm out of the twilight zone, I want to thank Rod Serling for being my guest. And if I can stay out, I'll be seeing you next week for Jell-O. <laughs>